This is section 13.5a, part 3. In example 4, we have an integral that's completely set up for us. It's in rectangular coordinates, of course, as we can see from the dv being dx, dy, dz. The unfortunate part, however, is that I don't know how to integrate this with respect to either x or y. The u substitution would require either a 2x, if it was with respect to x, or a 2y if it was with respect to y, and I don't have an either an x or a y outside my radical. So I really need to think about something different. The fact that I've got x squared plus y squared here tells me that maybe I want to consider cylindrical coordinates. I know that's such a nice r squared that that would be a really easy way of getting around my problem. I'd like to consider what the limits of integration tell me about the region before making a final decision. So x goes from x equals the square root of 3 times y to x equals the square root of 1 minus y squared. Oops, x equals there. y goes from y equals 0 to y equals 1 half. I'm actually not going to bother listing the z's. And the reason for that is that z in, polar co in uh, cylindrical coordinates is the same as z in rectangular coordinates. So the z limits of integration aren't going to have to be changed. Let's sketch this region. x equals the square root of 3 times y. That's just a straight line through the origin. Uh, the slope would actually be 1 over the square root of 3. So slightly below the diagonal. And then x equals the square root of 1 minus y squared. Um, I know that's a semicircle. It's going to be the right side with the positive x values. So there we go. Half a circle of radius 1 and then our line y goes from 0 to 1 half, and I think it's very likely that that intersection point is going to be at 1 half, although we'll verify that. We can find the intersection just by setting the x's equal to one another. Squaring both sides would give me 3y squared equals 1 minus y squared. So 4y squared is 1. And we can see that that does indeed give us y equal 1 half. I took the positive square root since it was clear that my intersection point had a positive y. All right, what piece of this picture is actually our region of integration? Well, we go from the line to the semicircle. So start from the line, end at the semicircle. And we've got this little tiny chunk right in there. Notice that's also consistent with y going from 0 to 1 half. All right, well, I like the region. That's just a polar rectangle. I like the integrand in polar, so let's make the change. To rewrite the integral, my integrand becomes the square root of r squared, which will make r in the next step, and my dv is r dz dr, d theta. The z limits of integration have not changed. They're still negative 1 to 1. To figure out the other limits of integration, I'm going to go to my picture. This is now my region, capital R. And it's clear that the r values themselves just go from the origin, r equals 0, out to the circle of radius 1, and, of course, that circle is just the circle r equals 1. To get the theta, I'm going to have to work just a tiny bit harder. Theta is actually the angle that's determined by that line. So let's go to the line. x equals the square root of 3 times y. If I were to, uh, let's see, I'm going to start by dividing the square root of 3 over. 
and then dividing the x to the right hand side. And then remember that y over x is tangent theta in our polar conversions. So the inverse tangent of 1 over the square root of 3 is pi sixths. Clearly a first quadrant angle, so I don't have to worry about that. So our theta is going to go from theta equals 0, which is our x-axis, to theta equals pi sixths, which is the equation of that line. All right, much better setup. I'm much more anxious to get started integrating now than I was with the original. So let's do it. I can use my trick on the theta because there's no theta anywhere in here except for the d theta. So I'm going to say let's take care of the theta integral right now just by pulling down that pi sixths. Square root of r squared is really just r and r times r is r squared, dz dr. Integrating r squared with respect to z, r squared would be a constant, so we just get r squared times z. From z equals negative 1 to z equals positive 1. And let's see, plugging in the 1, which is give me a 1r squared. Subtract, plugging in negative 1 for z would give me a minus r squared. And so we end up with 2r squared. dr. Last integral, so I'm going to run it on the calculator just to save me a little bit of time. And when I did that, I got 2 thirds. So pi over 6 times 2 thirds uh, simplifies to pi over 9. All right, so we've done several examples now of using cylindrical coordinates to find the value of an integral. And in every example we've done, we've been able to use this idea that x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. In the last two examples, we're going to explore some slight changes on that. And we're going to say, what if x squared plus y squared is actually not the most convenient pair of variables to convert to the polar variables? Sometimes it's actually helpful to rearrange our thinking and use either the xz plane or the yz plane as the polar plane. I'll show you exactly what I mean by that in these next two examples. In example five, we'd like to use a triple integral to find the volume between this paraboloid and the plane x equals 12. Now there is a typo here, if you would fix this for me. It should say x is equal to 3z squared plus 3y squared. And as I look at that, I'm thinking, well, gosh, if y squared plus z squared were equal to r squared, then that right-hand side would just be 3r squared, which would be really nice. And so why not? Let's let the yz plane be the polar plane this time. That means that all of the conversion equations that normally apply to x and y now apply to y and z instead. For example, y would be r cosine theta, and z would be r sine theta, and y squared plus z squared would equal r squared. This is actually the one I'm going to use right here. Because what that, that's going to allow me to do is say x, then, is just 3r squared. And then I also had x equal 12. And I can use those as my boundaries.
All right, let's sketch this. You can, of course, sketch these in either GeoGebra or Maple. I'm just going to do this one by hand. This is a paraboloid again, but it opens around the x-axis. Like so. And then x equals 12 is a vertical plane. I'm just going to assume I stopped at the perfect moment. And that vertical plane is cut off right here at x equal 12. The paraboloid has equation x equals 3r squared. If I need to know the intersection, and I will, I'm looking at the circle projected back into the yz plane. That's going to give me the region r. And just like I always do, I'll find the intersection by setting these equal to one another. If 3r squared is equal to 12, then r squared is 4. And the radius of that circle would be 2. There were no limitations as far as restricting to a particular octant. So I'm going to use the entire circle as my region r. And again, that's just the projection of that circle back into the YZ plane. All right, we'll go to set up our volume integral. And I know to get a volume, I integrate the function 1. The cylindrical form of dV is R, and instead of dZ, I'm going to have dx this time. Notice y and z being the polar variables means x stays the same. x is still equal to x. So dx, dr, d theta. The x values going from back to front go from 3r squared to x equals 12. The radius goes from 0 to 2. And the theta values go all the way around the circle from 0 to 2 pi. All right, we're ready to integrate. Looks like my theta trick is going to work. No theta is anywhere other than the d theta. So I'll take care of that first integral right away just by pulling down the 2 pi. And then integrating r with respect to x gives me rx from x equals 3r squared to x equals 12. Plugging in the 12 is 12r minus plugging in x equals 3r squared times that r would make it a 3r cubed. Down to the last integral, which for convenience I just did on my calculator, gave me 12. Gives me a total volume of 24 pi. All right, one last example here. Example 6. straight for you. There we go. This time we want the mass of the solids bounded by the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 51 and the hyperboloid of two sheets minus x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals 1 given a density of 10 grams per cubic centimeter. Alright, well once again I'm going to try and sketch this although we may go to maple for a prettier graph. We'll see here. I have a sphere of radius square root 51.
That one's not too bad to draw. And then I've got this hyperboloid of two sheets. And that one, you may even want to go back to your reference sheet on graphing those. Um, the y is the only positive variable, so my intercepts are going to have to be on the y-axis. If x and z were 0, y would be plus or minus 1. If y and z are 0, I would have imaginary values for x. And if x and y are 0, again, I would have imaginary values for z. So there are no other intercepts. And I get one piece of my hyperboloid opening this way and the other one opening that way. So I've got this kind of little cup that's coming out here and intersecting with the sphere on this side. And then I have an identical setup on the other side. Like so. Um, not too bad, actually. I thought it was going to be worse. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll ride with it this time, although I would encourage you to go to either GeoGebra or Maple and make that picture if you'd like to. I actually don't have it set up ahead of time this time, so I think I'm going to go with my picture. All right. These are not particularly nice equations to solve for x, y, or z. I'm going to create a lot of square roots when I do. So I'm thinking that perhaps, once again, cylindrical coordinates would benefit me. To decide which plane to use as the polar plane, I'm actually going to go to my hyperboloid of two sheets. The sphere doesn't help me. This could be r squared, that could be r squared, or even x squared plus z squared could be r squared. It wouldn't matter when I think about the sphere. This equation, however, has a very definite preference. x squared and z squared have the same sign. In fact, if I got y squared by itself, by moving the x squared and z squared to the right hand side, I can now see that x squared plus z squared equaling r squared is probably my best bet. So let's let the xz plane be the polar plane here. That means that my hyperboloid of two sheets is y squared equals r squared plus 1, or y equals plus or minus the square root of r squared plus 1. All right, so this surface is y equals the square root of r squared plus 1. That surface would be y equals the negative square root of r squared plus 1. If I do something very similar for my sphere, let's see, the sphere was x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 51. If I also solve that for y squared, I would get 51 minus x squared minus z squared. And since x and z is the polar plane, I could just make that into a minus r squared. So y would be plus or minus the square root of 51 minus r squared. This is y is equal to the positive square root of 51 minus r squared and this one would be y is equal to the negative square root of 51 minus r squared. All right, I'm making some good progress here. Um, I think looking at the symmetry, we definitely have symmetric objects on the left and the right, and the density is just a constant 10. 
So I really think that using symmetry and maybe just figuring out the side and doubling it is going to eliminate some of the work I would otherwise have to do. So let's start to set up our mass integral. And I'm going to double so I don't have to do the left-hand side. I integrate the density function, which is 10. And since the xz plane is the polar plane, that means y this time is still y. So I have r dy dr d theta. The limits of integration on the y have to go from left to right. So the left side is the square root of r squared plus 1. And the right side is the square root of 51 minus r squared. Now I still have a little bit of work to do to get to the r and theta limits. We need the intersection. It's actually this circle in here where they intersect. And as usual, to get the intersection, I'm going to set these equations equal to one another. So let's see, I would have the square root of r squared plus 1 equals the square root of 51 minus r squared. Or just squaring both sides, r squared plus 1 equals 51 minus r squared. 2r squared is 50, so r squared is 25 and r is 5. And we have a circle of radius 5 for our region, capital R. There's no limitations, so we'll use the entire circle. Meaning my limits of integration on R go from 0 to 5, and theta goes all the way around from 0 to 2 pi. All right. I should have probably given us a little more space on this one. Sorry, I'm going to squeeze it in. Let's do a couple things in this next step. I'm going to pull the 2 times 10 out and make it a 20. And then I'm also going to use my trick on the theta and pull down a 2 pi. So in actual fact, I've got 40 pi outside my integral now. Then the integral of y dy is r times y for these limits of integration. And that's going to give me r times the square root of 51 minus r squared minus r times the square root of r squared plus 1. And that being just a single integral now, I can finish that on my calculator. Sorry, I hadn't had that one done ahead, so I paused and did it real quick. When I did the integral, I got 33.3546. Didn't turn out to be a nice fraction at all this time. So I just multiplied that by the 40 pi, and I came up with about 209.573 for the value of the mass. And I guess we didn't have units this time. That would be in grams. All right, that brings us to the end of section 13.5a.